Chapter 66 Crib Leia gazed at the man in the photo, lost in thought. After receiving the request for help, we set off two days later to gather relevant information, she said. Madame Poilis's full name is Poilis de Roquefort, isn't it? She paused for a moment before continuing. We investigated the Roquefort family in Dariesh and found no trace of Poilis. In Intis, a woman could choose to keep her maiden name after getting married. If there was a de in her name, it meant that she was once a noble. The Intis meaning of de was from, and the surname behind it was the fiefdom of the time. None? Lumin was surprised. He knew something was wrong with Madame Poilis, but he didn't expect her identity to be fake. In Dariage, Roquefort is a large family with many members, including a provincial senator. We were in a hurry and didn't have time to conduct a more detailed investigation. We could only confirm that there was no such person as Poilis, but a man named Poulet had been missing for over a year. Poulet? Lumian asked. What's his relationship with Madame Poilis? They look alike. Ryan shook his head. Without enough information, it's impossible to make a guess. What we do know is that Poulet de Roquefort was a popular dandy in Treyar, and he had many illegitimate children. Many people hated and detested him. Perhaps this is why he had no choice but to leave or was forced to leave Dariège. Dandyism? Lumin was unfamiliar with the term. Aurore subscribed to magazines and newspapers targeted towards women or focused on national affairs. There were some materials on the supernatural, but none involved male matters. Leia chuckled. To put it simply, it's a Casanova who dresses fashionably, speaks elegantly, and acts freely. Lumian sighed and mocked. The people of Treyar sure know how to live life. They package their affairs as a thought, a doctrine, and a trend. When it came to cheating... Treyars were at the forefront. The Padre, in front of the Treyars, he was still a child. In the past year, Treyar has constructed numerous arcades, Aurore remarked while sipping her Marquis black tea, regaling Madame Poilis, Nazelli, and the others with the latest trends from her two-story subterranean abode. What's an arcade? It's a covered street with glass roofing and marble flooring. Elegance and stunning shops line both sides. During the day, light filters in from above, and at night, gas lamps illuminate the area. Carriages are prohibited from entering. The most renowned arcade is called the Opera House Arcade. Madame Poilis, holding a white porcelain cup filled with black tea, watched Aurore with her bright brown eyes, listening intently with a smile. That sounds like something I must see. Nazelli sighed, imagining the elegance, fashion, cleanliness, and brightness of the arcade. Aurore's knowledge of the latest Intis trends was the primary reason why they had accepted the afternoon tea invitation. After chatting for a while, the discussion turned to Aurore's work and relationships. Love is just so unfathomable and elusive, Madame Poilis mused aloud. So this is why you fall in love with so many men at the same time? Aurore couldn't help but inwardly criticize. Madame Poilis gazed at her with a faint smile and sighed. Sometimes I get so angry because of his mistakes. I wish I could kill him and send him to his death, but when he's actually facing death, I can't help but save him and refuse to tell him. Perhaps this is love. In the master's bedroom of the administrator's residence, Madame Poilis may have once fallen in love with Poulet, a believer of dandyism, and engaged in a forbidden relationship resulting in her disavowal by her family. She then had to marry someone and use her family's connections to secure the administrative position in Cordu for him. Lumian deduced this based on the stories and troops written by his sister. This explained why Administrator Bayos's standing in the family was relatively low. Perhaps, Ryan replied simply, keep searching, but don't attempt to open the safe or anything that may trigger an alarm. Lumian and his companions dispersed immediately and searched elsewhere. Despite the hunter's ability to observe subtle traces, Lumian still found nothing. The same was true for Leia and the others. They had no choice but to move to the study and search patiently. As time passed, the four of them arrived at the end of the corridor, 
where a closed room stood opposite an open solarium. Beside it was a staircase leading to one of the towers. Ryan, who had finished searching the solarium, turned to Leia. Leia touched the small silver bell hanging from her veil, mumbling to herself as she walked towards the tightly shut wooden door. This time, the four bells did not ring. Leia heaved a sigh of relief and gently pushed the wooden door open. It was an empty room with a rocking crib in the middle. The crib was made of brown wood and installed inside a wooden frame. It was covered in clean but slightly worn cotton swaddling cloth that showed its age. The crib was empty. This was the nursery where Madame Poilis' two children had once slept. Apart from the bed, there were no toys in the room. Scattered on the ground were wheat, barley, rice, rye, and other plants, making it look rather strange. Furthermore, these plants were well preserved, as if they had only been brought in a few days ago. Valentin's body glowed as he entered the room and circled around. Soon, he returned to the door and shook his head at Ryan and Leia. There's no evil aura. All right. Leia looked at Lumion. Shall we head to the tower next? Lumion had always been curious about the castle's two towers. He never expected to have a chance to visit them today. Valentin left the strange nursery. Ryan grabbed the handle and planned to close the wooden door and restore it to its original state. At this moment, Lumion's gaze drifted inside. The brown wooden crib swayed gently, yet the tightly shut windows of the room in the solarium opposite, with their floor-to-ceiling panes, allowed no breeze to enter the corridor. What? Lumion's pupils dilated. Leia notices distress and turns to look. The crib continued to sway, as though an invisible baby lay within its swaddling cloths. Leia raised her hand to her glabella, as if trying to ease her tired eyes. She readied herself to activate her spirit vision and see what lay inside the crib. Suddenly, the four small silver bells in her veil and boots jingled, as if they were about to burst. Ryan's face froze as he yelled, Get out of here! With that, he dashed into the solarium, crashing through the floor-to-ceiling windows in an attempt to create a path of escape from the castle. Bang! A loud thud echoed throughout the room as Ryan hit the windows yet there was no sound of glass shattering. The transparent faces of young children appeared on the row of windows, some of them mere infants with pale, inexplicably terrifying faces. As Ryan bumped into them, they opened their mouths in unison and let out a haunting wail. Their cries echoed throughout the third floor of the castle, casting an eerie gloom over the entire area. The walls and glass were adorned with the translucent faces of children some wailing while others stared blankly at Lumion, Leia, Valentine, and Ryan. Lumion shuddered with fear as he felt their cold gazes upon him. Suddenly, Valentine's body was engulfed in a dark golden light, which quickly spread to envelop Lumion, Leia, and himself. A warm sensation spread throughout Lumion's body, dispelling his fear and filling him with courage. He drew his iron black axe with newfound confidence. Meanwhile, Ryan seemed to grow taller and more imposing. Dawn-like rays of light surrounded him, coalescing into a silver-white full-body armor and a massive broadsword of light. With a mighty swing, Ryan cleaved at the floor-to-ceiling windows, dispersing the pale white faces of the children into smoke as they screamed. But the glass didn't break, and more faces appeared, their shrill cries tormenting Lumion and his companions. Who dares to trespass the castle? A woman's voice boomed, echoing through the halls. Almost immediately, Lumion spotted a figure on the other side of the corridor, standing on the second floor. She was a middle-aged woman with brown hair and eyes. She was rather good-looking without any wrinkles. She was the midwife who had helped Louis Lund's delivery. In her hand, she held a pair of enormous scissors that could decapitate a human while donning a grayish-white gown. It was as if she had just returned from pruning a branch in the garden. She glared at Lumion and his companions and spoke in a deep, threatening voice. You deserve to die. In the subterranean two-story abode, Madame Poilis jolted suddenly, and her countenance altered. She delicately placed the porcelain teacup on the table and smiled at Aurore. My apologies. I've just recollected an urgent matter that requires my immediate attention at home. Huh? Aurore was shocked. Poilis rose from her seat her expression filled with regret. I had intended to stay and discuss your work and its beautiful and poignant portrayal of love. 
Aurora responded quickly. Please, you're more than welcome. I cannot, unfortunately. Madame Poilise shook her head. It concerns my children. 